So I think we can get started with interviewing the main person that uh, you know we've all gathered here for, Monish. Uh, so Monish, uh, to, before I begin, let me just quickly give an introduction about Monish. So Monish, uh, as you know, uh, his co-founder mentioned, he is the founder of Haraba. He brings over more well, close to twenty-five years of experience across multiple domains. And having worked not only in India but even in the US for uh, more than 17, 17 years, then. for seventeen years uh, in technology, in finance, he's also passed the CFA exams, uh, different levels actually, and uh, has experience with marketing as well. To give you a quick brief uh, before, of course, he gives us more details about Haraba. So Harabag is building a nationwide uh, business network of participants involving farmers, uh, middlemen, packers, logistics, warehouses and the entire ecosystem of anyone, stakeholders in the agricultural uh, domain. Uh, and uh, this is amazing, I mean we really find people taking that step into agriculture. So Monish, if you could tell us a little about Harabag and what you're looking at doing. Sure. Uh, uh, so. Uh, let, can I start slightly differently? Absolutely. Yeah. Please. So one of the things that came up was, uh, what's people are interested in blockchain and So mm -hmm. let me just start explaining the way I see it. So I'm assuming in 1975, 76, 77, around that time, a lot of conversations like this were ha happening. Right? And people would say that somebody's come up with this new concept called a database. And you can have asset transactions. And you don't have to read data from a flat file. You can store it and it's stored there and you can read it and update it and stuff like that, right? So that was a paradigm shift. And after that, what happened is from flat files, you got Oracle, we got everything we run right now. Almost everything is in databases. Lately, we've started going on to text files, JSON files, etc. but it's still a database, right? That kind of a shift has happened with blocks. In the sense, the way we thought an organization or a program should work, that has radically changed. Right? So, and that is one of the reasons for Harabat to do what it is doing. In the sense, earlier, the data was composed or stored within an organization. So, the limit of an organization was just the data they had. So, Startup Grant has its own data, this office has another data. With blockchain, that data can be shared safely across multiple parties across the country and with that the shape of the organization changes. So that is the other side of Harabag. So now with that said, Harabag essentially, uh, my idea is, it's a link that links farmers, graders, institutional buyers, middlemen, all those people onto one network which can be viewed. One way to see it is if you've seen movies, so there's a train cut tracks up and you, the control room, there's a train over there, there's a train over there. That, that kind of visibility is actually needed in agriculture because there's, you always hear about shortages and uh, uh, oversupply in one place, tomatoes, people burning tomatoes and throwing tomatoes away, right? That's not because uh, things are wrong in the practices they do. The problem is that the supply chain isn't, isn't working. So. Those are some of the reasons for starting Harabag. Uh, once we did start that, we realized it's way more complex than what one person could handle or one company could handle. Because uh, in agriculture, uh, there's uh, just too much complexity because the practices in each supply chain, I'm calling, thinking of multiple supply chains, uh, each supply chain would be different. So for example, I'm guessing that tomatoes which are provided to Puna APMC, follow slightly different practices from green chilies because the packaging is different and the amount you can hold them is different, right? And that kind of a variability is, is a killer for startups. In the sense, you can uh, create, your, um, create a startup for Puna market, but then going to Kolapur, it doesn't work, right? So our thought, Harabag is uh, the base level network that all of these participants can use to run their business practices. That's really nice because uh, one of the things we see is if we act, you know, go to the market here, we see a lot of food being strewn around, thrown away, 
by uh, the people that are actually there. Yeah. And a lot of food that goes to waste. So, apart from that, and as you mentioned, that's something that you want to change or you know improve in the supply chain management, the existing supply chain management. So, as part of this, what more opportunities do you see in the agriculture supply chain? Uh, it, it, it depends uh, on how, how you look at it. I'm looking right now, my, uh, I'm looking more, most from the tech side, in the sense, sit in a server room and then control the world. But uh, on, on, once you go outside, there is a, a huge dearth of uh, cold chain, what you would say. Uh, that is, so once the vegetables get produced, how to bring it to market or where to store it safely. As one step through that, what has happened is, uh, this agri structures, output structure is fairly set for food grains. The stuff we did, FCI and stuff like that. But for the newer things, vegetables is actually a fairly new thing. The supply chain is not there. The, cha the reason supply chain is not there is that people, let's say you set up a whole storage, you don't know whom to buy it from and whom to sell it. Sure. Right, and uh, so, so that's uh, cold storage is uh, one huge option. Uh, if anybody is interested, you could actually get into vegetable production. It is, uh, at least from the numbers I see, it would be amazing because you can have three crops a year in a controlled environment and then you have a market, everybody is uh, eating. So that's another side. Uh, on the trucking side, I don't think there's an opportunity as far as the infrastructure is concerned. There might be an opportunity on the uh, coordination of logistics, but there are a lot of companies working on that. I mean, the multiple startups, everybody wants to do the Ola and Uber for trucking, so that kind of goes away. Uh, on the uh, uh, one other side which is open is on the output side is exports. Uh, exports in them is, uh, in my opinion, India has been the breadbasket of the world. Everybody has attacked India because there's more food over here. and. Uh, so, uh, we have the land, we have the people, and we can go on exports also. So, multiple opportunities possible. Great. So, when you're looking for partners for Harabad, and you mentioned that, uh, you know, of course, one company cannot do this alone. So, when you're actually looking for partners and identifying the kind of sectors that they specialize in, uh, which, who do you think would add more value as a partner to Harabad? in achieving your objective? Okay, so I'll answer it two ways. There are two different kinds of partners. There are partners who will help us build the network and the partners who will help us run the network. So the partners who would run the network would be a farmer, for example. or uh, So those are customers, but more, more like partners. Uh, there will be middlemen and there will be exporters and all those people. Uh, what's happening is internally, we being a startup, we uh, are uh, we want to bite significantly more than what we can chew at one time. So the idea is that okay, so can we have development partners? So a case in point, uh, we uh, I have deep tech experience, and I but I do not want to have a tech team right now because we cannot for one afford a tech team and we cannot attract a tech team. So we're tying up with two tech agencies to do things for us. So one, one company is working more on the app side, the other company is working more on the blockchain side. And then we're tying up another marketing company to help us market. And even though we have, in the day and I, we have deep marketing skills, we run our own marketing company before. Um, but again, that's outsourcing. So that's the other kind of partners we're looking for. Great. So I think, you know, since we do have uh, someone who's a farmer here, and someone who's actually involved in logistics, yeah. I think, you know, that's some those are the kind of partners that would be able to add more value actually with the existing systems in Harabak. Yeah, that's great. Um, now, since we have spoken about agriculture, we will come back to that. Uh, but with regards to blockchain, what opportunities do you see or are identified in the current market? Uh, could be, you know, of course, apart from agriculture. <coughs> Uh, opportunities and business models that you've identified so far? It's a, it's a big question uh, and uh, it, it revolves. Uh, so the two things in uh, the big thing that I see in blockchain is that with immutability in blockchain you can start creating businesses which are foolproof to say and I'll explain it 
you were very close, right? Uh, what, in agriculture, the biggest challenge has been uh, whom to trust. Uh, because most uh, interactions are one time, so I have some crop, I'm going to sell it to one guy. That guy's only going to deal with me once, so there's no incentive for him to give me the best deal. So that, and then next time I go, I go to somebody else, that, that, so there's a lot of cheating that happens. Uh, and when I say a lot, it still might be 2% of the, all the transactions, but that's still a lot. With immutability, what happens is, uh, you can uh, start creating a trustful environment. That it, trustful in the sense that if you do something wrong, you will get caught. And we will bring it out. So that's the base case we are working on. And, and the other is... Uh, the, the simple use of blockchain in the sense of sequence of steps so we can uh, create transactions. And so those are the... I'll, I'll answer the question different. <coughs> Though that is what we've thought of so far. And uh, as far as I think everybody is aware, uh, the concept of, uh, of what blockchain, is cap blockchain and related capabilities are able to do down the road is evolving every day. So like, yet, you were on the chat yesterday, yes. right? Right. So we had a conversation on uh, on one of our uh, Telegram groups, and they were talking about something. And those ideas will mix with some other ideas, and will mix some other ideas, and we don't know where this is going to go. And that's the fun part right now, in the sense that it's something completely unthought of. So what I understand from this is there are so many opportunities, but right now it's very difficult to exactly pinpoint with regards to where it could fit uh, because what, what we see is a lot of uh, of our participants here are interested in blockchain right they want to do something in blockchain but where do they begin i'll, I'll answer it differently that's i keep on saying that right? <laughs> so there's a first level innovation and a second level innovation so for the mechanical engineer we say i'm a mechanical engineer too, right so this is a story i've heard in olden times, right, uh, there used to be a steam engine for running a factory and the steam engine had this huge shaft which would run down, down the aisle and then they had these su subsidiary belts and stuff and they would drive machines, right? So that is one way to do it. Then the innovation happened that you would come up with an electric engine. So what they did was, if you save more money, it's more efficient, less noisy, less, uh, less people dying. So you put this huge, humongous electric motor to replace the steam engine, but everything remains the same. Then it took 30 years for people to realize you don't need this big electric machine. You can make smaller ones which are next to a motor, uh, the motor next to the machine. So what that does is you don't need the shaft. You don't need the belts and the pulleys and stuff, right? And you can reorient the factory around work as opposed to around the energy source. For us, we are in that thing, but you know those machines can be smaller. So most of people right now are talking about the first level innovation, in the sense, uh, uh, for example, accounting. So do we take accounting directly into blockchain? Right? The second question level might be, do you actually need accounting? Because if everything is on blockchain, man, it's there, you just click a button, you get your financial reports almost immediately. And that's, I think, the deeper thing to figure out is, okay, what's the next thing? next level? So uh, another side would be, uh, internet was one and YouTube was a layer that ex that came up after assuming that fast internet ex exists. So uh, if I, for people who are trying to figure out, is assume that there is perfect data available. What, what, how would you set up a company then? That's my, my take of what the opportunity should be. It's nice, you kind of see an opportunity in something that you can implement blockchain in, like an existing system, I believe. And re reorient it. Uh, another way would be uh, uh, office spaces, uh, design changed when they were from fans to air conditioning. So, if there were fans, you needed to have windows close by. If it's air conditioning, you could have a humongous thing with like 20,000 people in drone windows, right? That kind of stuff. So, with blockchain, that is uh, that is going to happen. The reason I'm saying this is somebody from here is going to do that. 
and it, my idea is to instigate that. You know. Um, I think one of the biggest questions here that many people would love to know about is uh, someone did mention you know they looking and interested in Ethereum and uh, everyone was obsessed with bitcoins you know yes. hearing a lot about bitcoins and the variance like the stock market even more with regards to the pricing uh, so there's also a lot of confusion between blockchain and bitcoins and there's also a lot of connectivity between blockchain and bitcoin if you could uh, maybe share uh, you know what yes. you do yeah okay. So, uh, Bitcoin, uh, from what I understand, and I think people over here actually know more than me on this side, is Bitcoin is actually built on blockchain, but blockchain itself is a much older thought, at least the thing uh, earlier. What Bitcoin did was it made the dynamics around uh, around uh, that process self-sustaining, in the sense, because miners get reward, that kind of works. Uh, so th those are separate things. Uh, what Bitcoin did, in my view, is it brought out blockchain as a usable technology, and it's a great proof of concept for what can be done. So now we have a worldwide database of all transactions that happen. So nobody, uh, so no, uh, there's one. So no bank is going to say, "Hey, give us a proof of concept of if blockchain would work." I mean, it works. They might say they. A particular implementation may not work, but as a concept, it works. So that is there. Uh, as far as the speculation is concerned, that is amazing. We know it's probably going to crash sooner or later. That's why I'm not in it. I'm investing my money in the business and not in that. But after the crash, it will rise again, and that's what happens in all the hype curves. But what this is doing is it's educating people. Uh, we have. In the last six months, the amount of people talking about blockchain has gone up, Bitcoin has gone up, right? So, this is actually, the, the hype is driving more creativity, more interest into the business. I think that's actually a great thing, and people are earning money out of it too, so that's even a better thing. Fantastic. Uh, so, with regards to Araba, when you actually kind of got this started, yeah. uh, what were, of course, you're putting your team together. Yes, great. Right. Uh, and then you were also looking at the market that you were looking at entering. Yes. So, what kind of different factors did you have to consider, you know, before you started at all? Yeah, so I'm sure I'll answer that question. I'm the kind of person who doesn't think much and jump in first and then figure out what to do. So I was running a company before this, which is in agri inputs. That's selling seeds, pesticides to farmers, but to dealers, to farmers. Around that time, the feedback we got from everyone was, from farmers was, we buy the good quality products, <coughs> but we can't. We're not able to sell it. So I left that last year, uh, Testa, previous company, and started Haraba. And in Haraba, the thought was that we will link farmers to institutional buyers and make deals and the numbers were amazing right? so we uh, I did a Facebook campaign uh, in Marathi and uh, signed up 3,000 farmers in like two weeks uh, we went to Mahindra and they said haha 10 lakh ki sabzi le le ek din we were very excited right all excited so we worked on 11 deals and were not able to close one deal because the buyer is ready to sell uh, sorry, the seller is ready to sell, the buyer is ready to buy. The matchmaking of the location, timing, quality, trucking, transportation, that was a huge complex thing. And so th that, that was what we learned needs to be done. And that's at that time we kind of pivoted in the, so what the realization came at that time was there's a lot of knowledge that exists with people who are already working in the supply chain which cannot be transplanted or cannot be learned by us not within like even two years three years effort right so then the idea was to leverage them they, they what they were doing and be able to achieve our ends also so so that was one of the primary things for starting Haraba, right now within agriculture uh, among agri startups and all the vcs talk about it is Scaling a startup is almost impossible. 
because you would start in one local district, uh, yeah, district is local, and then kind of just when you want to go to a state level, the costing doesn't work out by reaching far, to reaching farmers. So by one statistic, somebody was telling me, each district has around 700 government officials who are responsible for government departments. And it's a huge number and we can see that that's not working out. So one of the things for us was to, how do you reach farmers? And luckily, uh, uh, thanks to uh, Flipkart and Geo and all that stuff, reaching farmers digitally is much easier. So what, what we are designing, Harabag around is that we are designing ourselves around a farmer. So normally companies are, they make a product and then they get customers. For ours, the first thing is let's get customers first and then do products around it. That is the difference, uh, different approach we are taking in Harabag. Our first product which is going live today is called Kisan Coupon. Uh, it's essentially a cashback coupon which manufacturers, agri-input manufacturers, will give to a farmer. And it's this low amount of coupons, 20 rupees, 50 rupees. Uh, manufacturers are excited, farmers are excited, and uh, we, we are excited to see what kind of uh, download, number of downloads we get. But that way that we get the customers first, and that solves many problems. Uh, and that's, that's our approach right now. Monish, one of the things that is uh, Kisan Kupu, yeah, right? Now you're focusing on farmers, and there's a lot of uh, digital push that's been given by the government of India. However, what we see is there's a big disconnect in the kind of digital access available with farmers and the kind of businesses into agri tech. Yes. So, how are you looking at overcoming this challenge? So. Uh, we are all Indians, and if there's money to be made, we'll learn something. <laughs> right? That's Kisan Kupan. There is money to be made. Right? It, it, it's a very simple app. The way it's designed is, you don't have to type anything. You just click a photograph, upload the coupon, upload the invoice, not the, upload the invoice, upload the product photo, and you get money in your other card account. Right? So, and so that's our push. In the sense that if there's money to be made, you come online. Now, that being said, uh, the number of people online in uh, farming community is immense. Uh, a year and a half ago, we reached around one quarter farmers online. A year and a half ago, this year, I just did some push on uh, Facebook on uh, Kisan Kup on one day uh, boost, and we were reaching like getting 4,000 likes a day. So, people are there. Wow. See, the numbers are huge. Even if 2% of farmers are online, there are like 10 crore of farmers. You're talking about 10 crore, it's good, whatever, 20 lakhs. It's a huge number. Yeah. In the past, when we've actually had uh, you know, the founders talk about the experiences, they were talking about reaching out to a couple of thousand users online. You know, maximum 10,000 and we were in awe, we were wondering, wow, how did you manage to do that? And you reached 1 crore farmers online. That was, yeah, yeah. You have to tell us how, because how did you manage your marketing campaign to reach okay. a crore farmers and that will India? So, it was a photo contest we ran. Uh, the goal was that uh, uh, people will click photographs, farmer related photographs, uh, so there's best technology, best Best looking farmer, best looking female, da da da, that kind of stuff. Uh, with a cash price of, total cash price of 11 lakh. And the goal was, the photo was, the highest voted photo will be selected. So it was on the participants to upload and share photographs. And that's what worked. So it was a small financial incentive. And even the 11 lakhs, we didn't pay for ourselves. Our advertisers paid us. So they sponsored. Uh, so they sponsored the categories, and then we. You know, so uh, coming back to that, the incent, the money incentive. You know, just talking about the one crore farmers, that's still ringing in my mind because I just can't seem to get over it. Uh, like, how did we get the advertisers and so many more questions? 
Uh, but let's look at when you actually have these farmers, yeah. right? When we run a social media campaign, when we run an SEO campaign, we get a lot of first time users coming and we are drawing a larger audience. But what's challenging is having them come back to us again and again and again. So what is your strategy for capitalizing on the audience that you've already built? So on, on, in that one, that was in the previous company. Uh, we didn't, that was a one time thought. Uh, what we were thinking was we'll do this contest once a year and kind of continue that. But I left last year and then new management came, new thoughts, right? So we, we didn't have any, anything like that over there. Uh, this contest was part of a larger effort of we were doing online farmer communication and since we had a fair website and we were sending information on better farming and stuff like that. That's called as the talk, this is part of that. So it was uh, more outreach in the sense of uh, news and regular social media engagement. That uh, in the current version, we are assuming the engagement will be based on coupons and uh, more more usability and more uh, business oriented engagement as opposed to more entertainment oriented engagement. That if I can explain that. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so I'm going to try and move a little to your experience working in the US. Right, we have a lot of uh, founders of startups and you know organizations, and most of them do business with clients in the US. So, if we have to ask you, how do you identify what kind of opportunities do you see working and targeting Indian customers and uh, comparison between Indian customers and US customers? Okay, uh, so, uh, how do First, firstly, I mean, I've lived there a long time, right? I don't think we should be actually looking at the US. We've got more customers over here, right? So that, that goes without saying, right? Uh, on the other side, another thing that I noticed, and when I came to India, I was into film, uh, film kind of stuff. I think it came out was in the US, you have to be good at what you do, right? I mean, if you want to get into films, you have to. It is in Hollywood, the saying is talent is given. I mean, you know you're talented, then it's luck or something. If you want a, a, a job as a, a top developer, the thing that goes in US is okay, if you have only, if you know only eight languages, software languages, you don't, you're just a beginner, that kind of thing, right? In India, it's not that situation. In India, you just don't suck and you're fine. <laughs> <laughs> It's as simple as that, just don't make stupid mistakes. From the market point of view, I think Indian market is so much easier. So the app you're developing, it's, it might work, it might not work, but it's fine as for the, the people who've been testing it, they said it works beautifully. You get a bug somewhere or the other, but yeah, that's acceptable. In the US market, I mean, I will be testing, load testing with 50,000 users, and then be able to release to market. So from that point of view, I think the Indian market is actually easier. You might be the first one in. And uh, yeah, it, uh, it, it might help your family and people around. The dish of the thing that comes up. But uh, on, on the US market, US market is very competitive. And uh, I'm sure you all of you know, it's very competitive, very effective, and they are used to the best in the world. That's my take. Great. Uh, so in comparison again, yeah. the US market and the Indian market, uh, you have to share some challenges with regards to funding. You know, because everyone's looking for funding. <laughs> People yeah. say it's, uh, you know, it's a very different market. So if you could share some experience about your funding. So I can talk about the experience funding in India because I've been here for eight years now. Uh, and US now was more working at that. We tried to start us, but we never reached the funding stage. Uh, the big disconnect in India is that the investors don't understand startups. There is always catch a cash flow kitna hai pehle teen saal ki wo dikhao. Agle saal will I get my money back? How do you prove that you will get your money back? And so that's a challenge. Also, uh, we were talking to some. Uh, we were at the Mumbai Angels event last couple of days ago, and they were saying that even even in India, there might be just 500 angels who are active. 
and uh, that is the other side of it. And since there's not a lot of people, now that said, uh, it's not that there's not enough money in India. So uh, we deal in the agri sector. Usme, like even the small sellers are fairly well off. Unko samajh nahi aaya paisa kya invest kare. Right? Wo paisa pada wo char ghar kare liye. Gaon mein three flat hain. But abhi kya kare uska wo prices bhi nahi bad rahe. Right? So part of the thing is that we might not be telling the right story. Uh, like so, the model we are working on in India, uh, it, as far as fundraising is concerned, is a model that was worked in Silicon Valley. Or Silicon Valley investors who are risk risk prone. Uh, to give an example, uh, in the previous company it was more, uh, started by the main investor was from a guy from the U.S. Right? He got a valuation then from the U.S. The valuation was twenty seven million. We got a valuation then in India. He said three million. <laughs> Because this guy looked at cash flow for the next four five years. The U.S. guy looked for the real estate value after five years. He looked at five years. के बाद eternity तक कितना पैसा आएगा उसको अब भी तो present value कर दो huge difference. So हमको I don't I mean that's my experience so far. I mean if somebody gives me money tomorrow I'll change my story. But we mentioned about agriculture funding and especially that's where the government is involved. We hear a lot of initiatives by government funded agencies. Yes. That are exploring and uh, you know analyzing companies in the agri tech sector. Yes. So that's the agriculture innovative uh, uh, technology or even uh, farming technology, technology or otherwise not technology sectors. So what's your experience been so far uh, working with the government? Oh, I made sure we do not work with the government. <laughs> <laughs> uh-huh. So uh, I'm. Uh, So the the role of the government is to preserve the current order, and the role of the startup is to destroy the current order. Right. So we cannot work hand in hand. Also, uh, when we started in in the previous company, in agriculture, which was in 2014, and at that time Modi government had just come in, they were saying uh, e-commerce is going to be banned in India. And agriculture is a sensitive topic. There was threats that okay, I might be going to jail. Being the director of the company, so I had money to flight later to come Delhi, just say that. But so then we decided was that the advice we got from government people also was that don't ask for us for approval, but just don't do anything wrong. Because the role of the government is to prevent bad things from happening. It's for us to find out what the good things are. So we kind of left it at that, and Desta we worked, we structured it that uh, zero government involvement. Uh, the secretaries we talked with was fine with it. Unofficially, they were fine with it. Right? Even now, where I'm structuring Haraba, we're structuring Haraba. This minimal government involvement, and uh, you can always design a company that way. Right? On the other thing you asked about was that the government is working on it. Right? The government is actually scared, and like she and I were talking today. Yes. For a farmer, farming is uneconomic. If I was a farmer, I would not my, tell my kids to go to farm. I'll say, become a security guard. Around se bedna karta. There's nothing you have to do. You get money, you can send money. Right? Farming is uneconomic, and nothing is happening at the farmer level. So in, in the supply chain, I think everybody earns other than the farmer. Now the government is scared that if the farmers stop farming, how, what are we going to eat? And what are those guys going to do who are farming who are no longer farming? So that is the big fear among everybody. Now that being said, uh, the government is working a lot with uh, other lot of agri-tech startups. But I think uh, in uh, in India we would rather believe. What the big senior people of 30 years experience would say, than to a guy who has been running operations for two years, the sort of college. So uh, there is one guy who says senior level Bitcoin kabi nahi chale, okay? And there is this 24 year old kid who comes and maybe the 400 Bitcoin I have missed in two months I have come here, right? But we still believe the 60 year old guy. 
So government is still going with the more old world models. But that said, I think government is actually making a great effort towards uh, getting the agri startups. Uh, what within the community of agri startups we've seen personally is there's a lot of talk. Uh, like the startup India thing came up, we applied, we got the results for brochure, out, yeah. But we don't know if we can get the funding coming in or which one I have. So it's, we'll have to wait and see what happens. True. Uh, you mentioned age experience, right? Especially mm -hmm. in the government, uh, they give, of course, they give importance based on seniority, right? And that's also the case with regards to investors or people with, you know, money bags. Sure. Because more than not, people that have uh, matured in their areas of expertise are the ones that control money. And uh, it's very difficult, you know, difficult for them to adapt to change. So, when you actually kind of go to them uh, with emerging technology ideas, there's always that uh, fear whether you know it could fail. Right? Yes. So, how what what are the challenges you've seen when you've approached investors or uh, even people without actually asking them for money, like you said, the government? All you like to do is have a POC in place proof of concept, run something where you can show the su the success you've been able to achieve. Sure. So what kind of, uh, you know what I mean, uh, you've hit a wall, like you mentioned, you know, you've hit a wall multiple times. So how do you break through that wall? Storytelling, yes. Okay. But <laughs> <laughs> you answered it, yeah. Uh, but, but go ahead. Yeah. yeah, so if you could share a little more like So it's, it's uh, so, uh, so, uh, just to make sure I understand the question. The thing is, we are trying to get to investors. We do have a newer technology. We have uh, we've been trying to convince them. They are not convinced, and right? Uh, assume them to be a customer. So you're getting feedback from them. So and it, it could go both ways. Maybe you need to improve your story. Maybe they are right, and you need to change something in the in the uh, in the thing you're doing. But the question, uh, the thing is, you are not selling a technology, you're selling a solution. And a lot of uh, startups and uh, especially the young guys who are just out of college, they, we, uh, I was one of them, we get enamored by technology. But the, so like for Haraba, uh, it, depending on whom I'm talking with, it's a blockchain solution or in the whole presentation in some time, there is no blockchain word doesn't come in. So for people, for different audiences, it's different way of thing. But one thing is very important is to, uh, whenever you hear a no, actually analyze that no and why that no was there. Is the the default answer is the guy's stupid, but <laughs> may not be. And if he's not, then you should extract that thing out and then use it for yourself. So uh, case in point, uh, we were at a blockchain pitch event. Uh, last December on 10th and uh, we told the whole concept of Harabag and everybody clapped and loved and said wonderful, wonderful, I'm exaggerating a little bit and then one guy said yes great but this will never work and we totally rejected man, that worked so hard and this guy said it will never work because you're not getting your first customer, where do you start from, so like spiral mein jana hai bade hone where do you start from? Yeah, so let's think. Next day we thought of Kisanti. But then that was actually taking feedback. At that time I was very angry with this guy. What does he think? <laughs> but then you have, you have to take feedback. Uh, recently I read this article saying many people that are experts in their own areas, we find very few of them starting off on their own startup, mainly because uh, you know, they try and achieve perfectionism. And one of the things you said initially was, you're someone who actually gets into it immediately, right? Because you see an opportunity, you get into it. But there's so many that have ideas and very good ideas to really create something new. What would you advise them? So, uh, you're, you're saying that there's a person who has a great idea. Yes. But is scared of 
taking the drugs. Scared of launching it or putting it together mm -hmm. because they're trying to evaluate the markets, they're trying to evaluate the response they get from the market. Yeah. And you know, they want the product to be perfect. Like you said, some people, you know, you have naysayers. They're going to say, this won't work, right? So, what would you advise to someone who have ideas and you know, they, would, they should really go after it? Uh, so, how do you eat a watermelon? One bite at a time. So, I would say start small, but that's, uh, that's another way to say. Uh, if, if a person is hesitant on one idea, the question is to find out why the person is hesitant. Is the idea not good or is the person... Uh, is the idea not good or the person is in feminist of the idea or the person is scared of something in the middle? Uh, case in point, I'll, I'll tell you what changed my life. The thought was, a few years ago I realized I'm probably going to be living till I'm 90. Okay, that still is 40 years. And even if I spend 4 years working on something right now, still gives me 36 years of good stuff. Granted, I mean, there are replacement organs and all that stuff, but still. <laughs> right? So, and that changes your mindset completely. So, anytime who's 25, even if he spends 10 years on something, growing, right? And he has his life that is 35, he's still, and that is 25 right now, is probably going to be 100, 100 plus. Right? It's a whole lot of time to. Right? So that is one way to see. Thank you. <laughs> it's a great, uh, great advice. Start small, but start nevertheless. Ye uh, yes, yes. Because otherwise, uh, I'm sure everybody's heard that song. I don't know. Madhumati movie thi. Aayega, aane wala aayega. So then it always happens. Get the contest. Moon is on that place, and Pizza Hut ka delivery boy yaha par hai. Or jab mera phone bajega, tab main wo kar. Yes, I mean. Uh, with regards to startups, uh, you know, many founders are already thinking about the big players who doing something in the same uh, area. You know, because at this point in time, there are very few startups that are actually reinventing the wheel. Something already exists, sure. something that you're doing. So, how, what would you advise the startup founders? to consider entry to barrier and you know, hive off the challenge they could face from the big players in the market? Uh, uh, read a book called Blue Ocean Strategy. Do you guys know Blue Ocean Strategy? Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, the, you have to go to a Blue Ocean. And if you want to fight a big guy, then you have to know why you're fighting or how, why you will succeed. It's not wishful thinking. I mean, this is war. Uh, <laughs> So, I mean, if I'm competing with the uh, Lance, which I would never, uh, <laughs> you have to know, okay, what do we have special that you can bring? On the other hand, you can devise the story in such a way that uh, your competitors become your customers. That, but they're definitely blue ocean. Don't, there's, there's no point doing something which other people are doing. That, that's my, my thing. You know, that was actually one of my questions uh, later. Mm -hmm. you know, which book would you recommend to our startups? Well, that's amazing. It's uh, Blue Ocean Strategy. There's many. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Uh, one thing for startups is read. Okay. Uh, so there is this, uh, the word actually comes, uh, and, and I mean it in the gentlest way is, that it happens that I But to do that is only the stuff we read in college, which is, Probably not business at all. So you read, read maybe a hundred books, two hundred books or something, and then something will come. Uh, so I know a lot of our participants have a lot of questions. So before, uh, just a question of the match <coughs> before we wrap up the final side chat. You know, it's very rare to have one member of the team, like you, you know, specialize in technology, in finance. And in marketing, yeah. right? So when you're looking at building a team, what members should one consider, considering the strengths that they bring to the table and they all start up? And how do they, how should they evaluate what team members they should bring on board? So uh, 
I, I, uh, so, two, two different answers. One is uh, skill sets as far as the technical skill sets. The other is styles of thinking. Uh, you want both op opposites. So you want uh, skill... Uh, ideally, you want a person who doesn't think like you. And you can still talk about that. <laughs> <laughs> right? So, uh, I, I'm the more of the... Uh, jumping kind and just go and start fighting and then Vidya's on the other hand, okay, let's take care of the other person. That, that jets, right? That, I, I would say that's the big, bigger take in a sense. As far as the individual skill sets are concerned, as far as technology, marketing, etc., I think that's case specific and the marketing. So it's like whatever skills you start with, you just add on the addition of If you, it, it's a matter of luck also, whom you get and what you get. Uh, the bigger thing is you play with the cards you're dealt with. So half man, that's the stick you can do. Yeah. Um, my final question. Now, a lot of the class think and look at someone else's success. You know, start up and saying, wow, I'm going to reach her. We're going to reach her. But what they miss to observe is the challenges, the failures someone has encountered along the way. Sure. So, if you were to share, you know, I would definitely love to know about many failures that or obstacles that you had to overcome. But if you were to talk about something that someone should really focus on and you know try and uh, prepare for beforehand, what would it be? So, uh, uh, there will be many failures, absolutely. Right? I was at one event, a uh, film related event, and they were doing uh, awards for uh, animated short films. And there was one company would win one, and one company would win. And this Tata, some company, they won a lot. They won like six. And I was on, so I wanted to talk to them. I said, You guys must be really talented. He said, No, they just made a hundred. <laughs> <laughs> Right? So my philosophy is, man, I mean, you can be talented, but then there's always the matter of luck. Right? So the reason I'm here today is that I was in Delhi, I'd come from the US, and there was nothing to do, I had some work in Delhi. There's nothing to do to Pravasi Bharti Film Festival. I was there, and there we were out smoking and there's this one director who said, hey, I met this guy, I said, I'm raising funds for a film. And he said, why don't you join Whistling Books? So that smoke break brought me here. But if I had gone five minutes later, to say name it, then I Whistling Books, then I would have been there, and then I would have been there. It's a matter of luck. But, so I would say, is try 10 things and one thing will my problem. But the more important thing is, you should be doing what you like to do. It should not be work. Because if it's work, then you might as well join a company and get paid for it. Okay. I apologize. Uh, one final question. Sure. <laughs> How do you manage work-life balance? Like, what would you advise? Because that's important. There is none. There is no <laughs> work-life balance. You're an entrepreneur, you don't do anything other than work. <laughs> I mean, you live, breathe, you wake up at 5 in the morning, you start working. You're sitting in an auto, you're working. You're coming home, you're working. You're eating, you're working. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> well, so that ends uh, the patience and uh, the morning. Thank you so much for your time and your amazing insights with regards to not just blockchain. And I'm sure a lot of our audience has amazing questions about blockchain in particular. So thank you for sharing your journey with Hari, you know, Harabag and telling us about your challenges and giving us a lot of uh, real-life examples that you have to overcome yourself. So let's give a big round of applause. <laughs>